We're going to talk out of Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 3 and following, the attitudes of an effective church. A couple of weeks ago, when we talked in, in Romans, we looked at surrendered life, the attitudes of an effective Christian. So we're going to build off of that because that's what Paul does and move forward as Paul begins to talk about the body life in the church. And this message we're going to be looking at really goes uh, two parts, and we'll figure that out when I get back. But we're just going to look at through the middle of verse 6 this morning, even though it says verse 8 up there. Now, last time we talked about being a living sacrifice, about being on the altar that God has called us to and that this is our spiritual service of worship. And to do that, two things have to happen in our life, two commands that Paul, Paul gives us. One is to not be conformed to the world, to not be conformed to the world, not just to stop doing what the world is doing, but to start doing what the world is not doing. And we need to start living a life different from the world, surrendering our rights and not calling evil good and good evil and start living different from the world. The second thing he talked about was being transformed by the renewing of your mind, letting God transform your mind into the mind of Christ and to have a new way of thinking and approaching and a brand new worldview. Those are the things that help you to understand what it means to have changed, to have the attitudes of an effective Christian. And what we talked about last week was not being conformed from pressure from the outside, but being transformed from power from the inside. That there is this new you that needs to come to the surface because Christ is in you. And what a great truth that is. And we're going to look this morning again how that works its way in to help us maximize our effectiveness as a body of Christ. And you look at the body of Christ today, and I read a story this week that reminded me a little bit about the body of Christ. And it was about a man in Orange County who got pulled over. This is a true story. got pulled over in the carpool lane by the police. And he was in the carpool lane. He was driving a mortuary van. And he had four deliveries that he was making. And he was alone, but he had these four deliveries. And he argued that this meant he could be in the carpool lane. And it went all the way to the, to the judicial system. The judge finally said, they have to be alive to count. And I wonder about the church today. How does God calculate the church today? What are the numbers that God sees and what God knows? Are you alive? Are you effective? Are you a part of something that God is doing? Is God living through you? Are you experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? We're going to look, about, look at that this morning, talk about three attitudes of successful fellowship of believers. I'm going to ask you to join me in standing, and we're going to read uh, starting in verse 3 this morning and go through the middle of verse 6. And starting in verse 3, it says, For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think is to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us each exercise them accordingly. And we'll stop right there. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I pray this morning that you would speak to each one of our hearts. I thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture that calls us to begin to live out in a practical way the truths that are real in our life because of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that we would place ourselves sacrificially on an altar and surrender our lives to you. And that the impact would begin to, to work itself out as we live as part of the body of Christ. Father, there may be some here this morning that have not followed you in the paths of obedience that you've called them to. And thank you so much for the testimony that was given through baptism this morning. That there are often things that are left hanging in our lives that you've already told us to respond to. And yet we haven't been obedient to it. Father, I pray that you convict us this morning. If there are any issues like that in our own personal lives. Father, maybe some here this morning that have been very religious. Maybe they haven't been. and Maybe they find themselves in a church today, but there's no confidence of a relationship with you. There's no assurance that they've placed the sins of their life at the foot of the cross and let your payment through your son, Jesus Christ, be sufficient to cover all the guilt and stain that was there. 
Father, we do love you and thank you for your presence among us this morning. And we ask that you speak to our hearts. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I'm going to give you three things this morning that I see in this passage that need to be a part of helping us to be successful together for Christ. And the first is the simple words, humility. We need to have humility. Verse 3 says, For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think is to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. To have humility in our lives, to have an accurate measure of ourselves. The Bible calls us, Paul called called a Timothy to self-examination, or called the Corinthian church to self-examination, when he said, test yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. That that is a process of life, that we are to continually look at what the perfect word of God says, and then look at our lives, because sin being a part of who we are gives us a natural tendency to think more highly of ourselves than we should think about ourselves. To see ourselves as we desire to see ourselves, rather than reflecting at ourselves through how God sees us. In fact, Paul says here, think as to have sound judgment. The idea there is to have sober judgment. That sin has this intoxicating effect upon us, and we need to sober up whenever we take a look look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves properly. Sound judgment is to know things that about ourselves, that that there are things about ourselves that we can't quite trust. There's a tendency to distort things, to overlook things. And we need to realize that that is a reality in who we are. And we're called here by Paul not to make sure that we don't think more highly of ourselves than we should, but to watch ourselves and to test every thought by the perfect word of God. Don Shula, there's a picture of Don Shula up there behind me. You can barely see that. You may not even know who Don Shula is if you're not very old. But Don Shula was a very successful football coach of the Baltimore Colts. You remember when they were in Baltimore. And also the Miami Dolphins when they were so good back in the 1970s. Well, Don Shula at one point in time especially was pretty well known everywhere. And it was hard for him to find a place where he could not be known by everybody around him. So they went up north into Maine, into a small seaside village, to try to go on vacation, he and his wife, so that they could find a place where people would not know him. Well, they got there. It was a rainy day. They decided they'd go see a movie. They went to a small movie theater. They walked into the movie theater, and there was a small handful of people. And when they walked in, all the people began to applaud. And Don Shula said to his wife, I guess there's nowhere that I'm not known. And he sat down, and he spoke to the... The man next to him as he sat down, he said, I'm kind of surprised that you know me here. The man had a puzzled look on his face and said, am I supposed to know you? The manager told us that we had to wait for at least two more people before they would show the movie. (laughs) So when you came in, we were excited. (laughs) We have a tendency to look at life and to estimate ourselves maybe a little higher than we should. But beware of taking an Make sure we make an accurate measure of ourselves. But the good news is that we should also make an accurate measure of our potential. Because in spite of who we are, Paul says there is a grace that was given to me that God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And all through the book of Romans, you find the wonderful truths that I am no longer in Adam, that I am a brand new creature. The Holy Spirit has come and the Holy Spirit is in my life. And I have this power that is available to me by God's grace. That I'm a new person. And I need to be on guard for the evil of the flesh in my life. But there is a power available for my life for me to begin to pursue victory by the grace of God. To live and understand where I am in the righteousness of Christ. And know that the Holy Spirit is a gift that God has given me through life. Someone wrote this about what you should do each morning. You need to tell yourselves three things each morning. Number one, you need to remind yourself that I am made in the image of God. I'm not an animal, but I am somebody who has reason, somebody who has choice. I'm in God's image to respond and obey and to make choices through the day. Second thing you can tell yourself every morning, I am filled with the Holy Spirit of God. There's a life and a power that's working in me that's beyond anything that this world has available to it. And the third thing you can tell yourself is that I am a part of of the plan of God. 
I'm a part of the plan of God. There is a divine purpose to my life today. There is a reason for my life being lived. I'm not to be a spectator, but I am a vital piece of God's puzzle. And I need to step out every day knowing that these truths are real. And they're a part of who I am. They're a part of my existence. Paul warns us that we need to, every believer needs to avoid one thing for sure, and that is pride. Not to think more highly. Not to think too highly of ourselves. Now, if anybody could have thought more highly of themselves, it would be D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a guy who was one of the greatest evangelists of the two centuries ago. He was effective. He could draw a crowd together. He, could, he had thousands of converts. Lots of institutions were started, and, and his name was placed uh, as part of the label of that institution. But D.L. Moody was a person who was not pompous at all, even though all these things were true about his life. And he was someone who was tolerant, understanding, and rarely criticized anybody else. One of his favorite sayings was this. He said, right now I'm having so much trouble with D.L. Moody that I don't have time to find fault with other people. That's how we should face life every day as well. Having humility in our lives. Not to think more highly of ourselves, but to always esteem the grace of God. Never underestimate it and expect great things of it each day as we surrender to allow God to work through our lives. All right, second word is harmony. Harmony, and that's a familiar word around here. What a great game on Friday night. This old high pollutant team comes in there thinking they're going to whoop us. And we got out there and prayed on the H, which now stands for hallelujah, instead of harmony, although harmony too. And uh, God had a different idea for that game. So that was a great game. And Hawkins the week before won 60 to nothing as well. So we are on a roll here in this area. But anyway, the harmony I'm talking about this morning is the fellowship that we have together. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. That we are members together working for the same game plan, for the same God's work in our life. We are all interconnected together for that. And we need to have harmony. We need to work together and not be harmful to one another. Read this week about a couple of robbers in Michigan who went into a, a, a video store. And they were waving guns in the air and telling everybody to stand still. One of them said, nobody move. But when his fellow robber moved, he shot him, shot him all of a sudden. That reminds me of the church as well. A lot of damage goes on. We are to be living and working together and uh, serving God together. God has put us together in an amazing way. Just the human body itself is an amazing thing. And I got some statistics on just this body that we live in, thinking about the DNA. There are 7.5 trillion cells in your body that are more complex than the most advanced computer. Each cell has 200 trillion tiny groups of atoms in it called protein molecules. The largest molecule is called DNA. It carries the hereditary information from the parents to the offsprings, and it carries the genetic code, and it determines whether you're going to be a man or a monkey or a mammoth or what, you know, all anything. It's going to determine that in your DNA. Your DNA in one cell is six feet long. Six feet long. The total DNA in a body would fill a box the size of an ice cube if you just scrunched it down. But if you laid it out flat and joined it all together... In these six feet long segments, it would reach to the sun and back 400 times. That's how long these strands are, even though they are so, so small in size. All our cells contain the information found in all other cells. That each cell in your body carries all the necessary information to make another you. In one little cell, it tells everything that can be told about you. And if the coded DNA information and instructions in one human or translated, it would fill a 1,000-volume encyclopedia. That is the intricacy, the amazing way that God has created the human body. And the church is a reflection of the human body. If you stand in front of a mirror and you look at yourself, and you begin to, to get past all the flaws, but actually look at how the human body is put together, you'll begin to get a sense of how God sees the church. God looks at the church and he sees one body, many members, all of them having different functions. 
If you take the church directory and you look at the church directory and you look for a, a picture of the church, it's not going to be on the cover. It's going to be when you open it up and you begin to see all the different pictures. It's not bricks don't go to heaven, people go to heaven. And the church, God's church, are us who are in the, this building today. We are one body, many members with different functions. The Bible says we are the body of Christ. Christ is ahead. We're members together with him. Paul loved to describe us by that, that descriptive phrase of in Christ. In Christ. And there's something important that you need to understand in that, in that phrase, in Christ. Because that is where you're supposed to be. Not just positionally true of us, but that is where you need to stay each day of your life. Someone said this, that people who usually get themselves in trouble in their spiritual life are usually those who have isolated themselves from the body of Christ. They've isolated themselves from the body of Christ. I am told that the strategy of lions in Africa is to isolate stragglers. They don't go for the middle of the pack. They try to maneuver individuals in an isolated position. Whether it's one that can't keep up, one that's too small to keep up, too old to keep up, or whatever. One that responds when they roar and flees the rest of the herd without thinking like they should, staying together. They go after the one that isolates themselves. And we're told in the Bible that the devil prowls about, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, seeking someone to isolate out so that he can devour them. That is the devil's first strategy is to distance somebody from the body of Christ. You might find somebody who says, well, I don't like what somebody said. I don't like what somebody did. I, I just need time away. Working right into Satan's strategy of isolating them away from the body of Christ. And I guarantee you, Satan knows which feathers to ruffle on each one of us. And the purpose is to isolate us away from the body of Christ. And this is why it's so important. You can never do the will of God in your life isolated from the body of Christ. Because the gifts that God gives you, the grace that God pours into your life is for service to the body of Christ. If Satan can isolate you out, you're not just more vulnerable, but you are not being effective for God's purpose, separated from the, the body of Christ. Second thing is we're many with diverse functions. All the members do not have the same function. All the members do not have the same function. Every part of us, although it's different, all, 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 we're one body with many members. Every, every member of that body has diverse functions. You can't separate one from the body. There was a lawyer who was defending a man who was caught in burglary, in the burglary and this lawyer had a creative defense. This is what he said. He said, my client merely inserted his arm into the window and removed a few trifling articles. His arm is not himself. And I fail to see how you can punish the whole individual for an offense committed by his limb. Well, the judge said, all right, using your lo logic, I sentence the defendant's arm to one year's imprisonment. He can accompany it, accompany it or not. <laughs> Whatever he chooses. Well, this lawyer was smarter than the judge thought because he smiled and the defendant smiled and the defendant took off his artificial limb, laid it on the, on the, the bench, and out he went. But, you know, the Bible, if we can detach so easily, the Bible says that's something that um, might be artificial, might be a fake limb, if it can be isolated and detached so easily away from the body. In fact, the Bible calls it a tear rather than a wheat. The body has many different parts that perform many functions. Some parts are visible. Some parts are not. If you stood in front of that mirror and you began to look at yourself and you tried to spot your liver, you couldn't see it. Try to spot your kidney. You know it's there, but you couldn't, you couldn't find it. Try to, fi the, to find your stomach. Try to look for your brain. You know it's there. You're supposed it's there. You know, some parts are not as visible as others, but are they not important? We call them vital organs. They are very vital. And there are some parts of the church, when they are not functioning, when they are failing, it's like those vital organs failing in our body. And when we're not 
that unseen prayer and that unseen devotional life that should be going on to make the body of Christ healthy, if that's not going on, we're failing inside. Our vital functions are beginning to fail. And we may have all the outer visibility, but those things are vitally important. And the body of Christ is like that as well. The people in the prayer closets are the very life, life of the church. Many diverse functions, diverse, but one together. We who are many are individually members of one another. We have this diversity, and instead of letting this diversity divide us, we should celebrate the diversity we have because that makes us more effective in reaching a very diverse and lost world. In fact, it's interesting that you look at all the organizations around the world and they are put together because of their similarities. You look at the NAACP, they're people of color. The NEA, they all have the connection of being teachers. The NRA, people with guns. AARP, that's my people right there. ACLU. That, uh, the CLU stands for clueless, in case you're wondering. <laughs> ACLU. But the only organization in the world, none, no other organization in the world can make the claim that the church does, that we are all different, but one together. The closest thing I could find was KFC, where they're all different in one bucket together. You know, we're, that's like the church, I guess. That's who we are. But we are all very different, but one together. And families are like that as well. When a family, when one hurts, all hurt together. When one is honored, all are honored together. If you wonder if that's right or not, just win the lottery and see how much your family wants to be honored with you. <laughs> but when one hurts, they all hurt together. You know, I broke my foot some years ago, and my whole body stayed up all night long together with that foot just to hurt with it. And, you know, that's the way it kind of goes with pain. When I had a kidney stone, one of the questions I asked the doctor in the deliver not delivery room, the... Uh, <laughs> wow. Felt like a baby, I guess. In the emergency room. Was a, why do I hurt all over? And she said, well, it's something your body does. It's called transferred pain. And it's all over your body. And our body is harmonious, good and bad ways. I mean, when we're hurting, we, hurt, we should hurt together. When we're happy, when we're joyous, we should be joyous together. And there should be harmony, realizing we're one body with many members, diverse functions, but we are one body together with one head, which is Jesus Christ. And finally, the last word is hard work. Two words, hard work. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us each exercise them accordingly. We are, number one, different by grace. Gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. This word for gift comes from a Greek word, charismata, which has the same root as grace. It has the same root as grace. This gift that you've given, been given is a free and unmerited gift. God chose to give you that gift. And what we know from Scripture is that nobody is left out. God has given to everybody at least one gift. On your spiritual birthday, just like in your natural birthday, on your spiritual birthday when you came to Christ, God gave you at least one gift. And the purpose of that gift is for the ability for service within the church. It wasn't given for you. In fact, the book of 1 Corinthians, part of that, and a major part of that, is Paul reprimanding the Corinthian church for abusing spiritual gifts by making them an end unto themselves instead of serving others with them. The gift that you've been given is an ability for service within the church. And you might ask, what is my gift? What is my gift? Well, somebody shared with me a good way of finding out what your gift is. When you are walking in the fullness of the Spirit, you will begin to operate in the air of your spiritual gift whether you recognize it or not. You want to find out what your spiritual gift is? You become obedient to your study of God's word. You become committed to time and prayer. You be faithful in the areas of obedience that God has placed upon your heart that you know are right for you. You, get a, you begin living with a life with a surrendered heart. And you'll begin to naturally begin to live out in God's grace and God's gift in your life. 
And you know, this gift that God gave you, God made the choice of the gift that you were to have and that I was to have. It wasn't the choice. In fact, I would have made a different choice than God would have made, made that God made for me. If God would have given me a list of choices that, of, you know, that we find here just in Romans chapter 12, I would have checked off everything. If he would have asked me to number them from one to, to the end, I would have put the last one, the one that he chose to give me. I guarantee you, nobody in here had a greater fear of public speaking than I did. When I was 16 years old, I about melted in a history class because they wanted me to, to share a history report. And I can remember being 20, 21 years old, 22 years old in a Sunday school class and just waiting from week to week to week. All this stuff was going through my mind, just waiting for the opportunity to be able to actually say something. And I remember when the day came that I said something in that class, I spent the rest of the class trying to recover from saying it. I knew my, my face was red, and I knew I was all these things going through my mind. That was the stupidest thing. You never should have said that. And, and just wanted to just sleek out of the class as quick as I could. But God chose to take a kid like that and say, I'm going to give this gift to that kid. And then God will take that gift. In fact, I can remember when I realized that that was what God was calling me to in life. That I, I went to argue with God. I went to the library at Tul in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I went up on the second floor, and I sat down at the table and began to argue with God that this was not the right idea. As I was just laying my head down and, and kind of meditating on the, how God was really messing up this time, God began to put in my mind an image of a bicycle, a bicycle, a bicycle. As I began to ask God to remove that image from my mind because it wasn't serving any purpose, God began to speak to my heart and say, you know, you take a bicycle. First time you get on that bicycle, and I can remember when I did, you're going to crash, you're going to run into mailboxes, you're going to run over dogs, you're going to run into trees. But you know what? You keep working at it. You work at it hard enough, you may be riding it in a circus on your head. It's not a different bicycle. It's just somebody who's taken a gift that's given to them and invested their life in it. And God may be trying to open your life up to begin using the gift that he's given to you. Every one of us has at least one. And the problem is not that you are not capable. It's that you have to begin investing your life. One thing that I had with all else that I did not have at that time, I had a willingness in my heart to become vulnerable for God. I had a willingness to struggle, to be stretched, and to trust God. With all the fear that circulated around that, God took that and God began to work in my life, his gift. We are all different by grace. We're all given different gifts. And finally, it's determined by God's call. Let each exercise them accordingly. Again, gifts and grace is the same root word. And the one thing about graces are, they're graceful. And as God begins to work his gift out in your life, there's something great about a person who's graceful at what they do, whether it's football, basketball, whether it's uh, uh, teaching, that it's a delight to watch. It's a delight to listen to. And as God begins to affect that spiritual gift in your life and you become more and more gifted by his grace to use it, it'll become more graceful in your life. And I love to watch somebody who is graceful in sharing their faith. I love to watch somebody who is teaching God's word and God is, has made them graceful in that. Watching somebody serve others or encourage a hurting person and God has just perfected that gift in their life. There are so many who are not even breaking a sweat spiritually for Christ. They're trying to live their entire Christian existence within this comfort zone. God says, you'll never live for me within that, within that parameter. But you've got to step out of that. You've got to allow, you've got to trust and begin to live by faith. And you've got to live a sacrificial life. And if you're choosing to make no effort in your Christian life, your Christian life is going to lead nowhere. And it might be suspect as being artificial. F.B. Meyer said this, he says, it is urgent Urgently needful that Christian people understand that they are not a company of invalids to be wheeled about or fed by hand, nursed and comforted, but they are to be a garrison in an enemy's country 
Every one of them have a duty and prepared to make any sacrifice rather than quitting. Realizing that is who we are. That is who we are together. Let me close by sharing with you that a group of deacons decided that they were going to take the church membership role and to go over at one particular deacon's meeting. And the, what they were trying to do was they were going to write down every member who, to their knowledge, had no ministry in the church and perhaps had no awareness of their spiritual gift. Within five minutes, they had over 100 names written down. Where would your name be? Are you aware of your spiritual gift? For one body, many members with diverse functions, what is your function in the body of Christ? The Bible says you have one. There's a calling that you have. There's a gift that God has given you. How is it being lived out in your life? Would you bow with me in prayer?